Former Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan has been arrested after he was convicted in a corruption case. What does this mean for the crisis-hit country? Human rights organizations have called for a probe into a migrant boat disaster that led to 82 deaths in the Mediterranean Sea. But will this have any impact on this terrible trend? This is the weekend episode of Daily Debrief and we'll be looking into these issues. But before that, please do hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Our first story is from Pakistan, where a trial court has convicted and sentenced former Prime Minister Imran Khan to three years in prison. Subsequently, he was arrested on Saturday. Khan was on trial in a corruption case related to the alleged sale of official gifts. Now, this case was one prong in a huge battle between the former Prime Minister and the Pakistani political establishment. The current Pakistani government, which comprises the two major political parties, has been desperately trying to prevent him from contesting in the upcoming elections. As of now, it's unclear what the result of this verdict will be. The last time Khan was arrested, that's a few months ago, massive protests took place in Pakistan. For an analysis, we go to Taimur Rehma, the General Secretary of the Mazdoor Kisan Party. Taimur, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, first of all, could you maybe take us through what the specifics of this particular case are, the case uh, under which Imran Khan has been convicted and sentenced? And how does this affect his political chances as per the law? As you may have heard, Pakistan is once again in the international news because the former Prime Minister Imran Khan has been sentenced to three years imprisonment and a 100,000 rupee fine in the Tosha Khana case. The Tosha Khana case is that heads of state or heads of government may receive gifts from other governments or other people, but those gifts have to be put in a special place or in, with a special department called the Tosha Khana uh, department. And um, if the prime minister wants, as long as the prime minister is serving, the prime minister can take those gifts, those watches or suits or cufflings or whatever they may be and use them for the evening. If the prime minister wants, the prime minister can also purchase those gifts from the Tosha Khana at a significantly reduced uh, amount. So th there's a certain percentage that you have to work out. If something is worth 100 rupees, you pay a certain percentage of that and the gift is yours to own as private property. That is what Imran Khan in fact did. He was gifted some very expensive, uh, he was gifted a very expensive watch and some very other expensive things and he purchased those from the Tosha Khana and sold them on the market and pocketed the difference. Now, the issue was that the amount of money he paid to the Tosha Khana does not cover the necessary amount to get that thing from the Tosha Khana. So that constitutes a violation of the law under which those gifts were taken by Imran Khan. That case, of course, went to court. And in the final days of the trial, Imran Khan's lawyer, in fact, stopped appearing in court because he said that the case was heavily biased. And this morning, uh, the court basically decided um, that Imran Khan was, in fact, guilty of corruption because he had given the Tosha Khana less money than uh, was its due, according to that particular process. And now the result is that about 30 minutes after the decision was announced, the Punjab police has gone and uh, arrested Imran Khan. This time around, there were no big riots, etc. And this is because on May 9th, there was a huge riot in Pakistan and the army really went after that. Um, you know, after the crowd and after the organizers of that. Nearly 100 people uh, were then pushed into the what is called the army courts, which are basically military courts. They were uh, not in the, even in the civilian courts and many others were in civilian courts. And there was a lot of pressure on PTI politicians to renounce Imran Khan and to give up the party. And in fact, a lot of people did exactly that. Right. So uh, I also wanted to talk about the fact that Imran Khan and the Pakistani political establishment, they've been fighting this legal and political battle for over a year now, especially after Imran Khan was overthrown. So does this conviction mark like a decisive moment? What are his chances for appeal and you know, how is that going to work out? Now, this sentence has been, um, you know, delivered. And uh, I think the public opinion will be, and my opinion personally also is, that on the scale of the different kinds of corruption that we've seen in Pakistan, this is not uh, one of the, you know, uh, a scandal of the scale and magnitude that we have seen in the past. It is a scandal precisely because Imran Khan always claimed to be 
absolutely clean, pristine, and pure. But it isn't a scandal that has, you know, altered economic policy in any fundamental way. So the fact that the court has given the maximum penalty, they could have given up to three years, they could have given a year, they could have given two years, they could have given six months, but they gave the maximum penalty also signals that in fact, the real purpose of this entire case, as well as of this conviction, was to knock out Imran Khan from politics. That is, of course, what the establishment has wanted. And that is also what the current government wants. They want Imran Khan to be completely knocked out of the race because they are unable to really compete with his very aggressive rhetoric, much of which is not necessarily true. I'm not saying that it's true, but it is effective in the sense that it has managed to attract a substantive section of the population. So what seems to be happening right now is given the internet, given the reforms of the International Monetary Fund, uh, given the conditions they've imposed, there's going to be a high, there is already and will continue to be a high rate of inflation, a low rate of growth, which is causing unemployment. For the PDM to go into elections, which are due in October, under these circumstances where they, they have not been able to revive the economy would spell disaster for them. For that reason, I think they are knocking out Imran Khan from the race so that they are able to win almost unopposed. And um, what this means, there's two things that this implies. Firstly, that uh, to, to convict a prime minister is not a small matter. Uh, unfortunately, this has happened many times in Pakistan's history. Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto was even hanged. Um, other prime ministers have also been convicted, uh, including Mian Nawaz Sharif, and now again, uh, Mr. Imran Khan. Uh, but it sets a very negative precedent because clearly these convictions are done with the intent of political victimization. Whenever one or another party f f you know, falls foul of the military establishment, such convictions follow. And the result, uh, I think the conclusion that it will bring people to is that really there isn't much of a democratic process in Pakistan. Um, the military pre-selects those people that are going to stand in election. And those politicians who, for that particular period in history, have a very decidedly anti-establishmentarian position or anti-military position will be completely knocked out of the race through various legal and other means. And that's what's happened with Imran Khan. So this is a very clear case, in my opinion, uh, of um, gerrymandering uh, the coming election. This is not to say that Imran Khan is not guilty of these things. I believe that the case there is also equally black and white, that he is guilty of not paying the necessary dues in the Tosha Khana case. I think that evidence is also clear. But I think the particular conviction that has taken place, the timing of the conviction, everything that's been surrounding it, the way his government was displaced in a vote of no confidence and so on and so forth, shows that the military has lost trust in Imran Khan and now, after May 9th especially, is, has really decided that they want to um, they want to finish the Pakistan Tehreek-e Insaf. And finally, one last question. We know that the Pakistani National Assembly is said to be dissolved in a few days. That's what the reports say as well. So, what lies ahead considering elections are probably going to be scheduled soon? The political climate will definitely heat up. So, what lies ahead for Pakistan? It's sad to see that the parties that signed the Charter of Democracy, that is the Pakistan People's Party, as well as the Muslim League, and the Charter of Democracy, of course, was signed much earlier in 2005, if I'm not mistaken. And its purpose was to come to an agreement that political parties will not use the military establishment against each other. They will not use unconstitutional means to destroy each other's government. And they will not persecute each other when out of power and that sort of thing. Um, now, it seems ironic that the parties that came together on this particular foundation, that they would not they would not use the military against each other, they would not persecute each other, are doing exactly that to their opponent, which is the Pakistan Tehreek e Insaf. In a sense, we've come full circle. The parties that were anti-establishment at one time have become the establishment. And the party that was the establishment, that is the PTI, has is now seems to be anti-establishment. Of course, none of these political parties are anti-establishment in the long run of things, but they may have certain issues in the short run with the establishment. They're not anti-establishment in an ideological sense or in a theoretical sense, but they do disagree with one another policy here or there or have a falling out, owing to which you see these sorts of musical chairs. So what will happen next? I believe that we are going to see an election very soon in which Imran Khan, obviously, having been convicted, will not be able to participate. And that through that means, the establishment as well as the current government will try to ensure that they win the coming election. That is what it seems is going on in Pakistan. Thank you. Thank you, Taimur. Very important.
uh, reflection at a time when Pakistan is definitely going through both a political and an economic crisis. Thank you so much. We'll get back to you soon. On this show, Daily Debrief, and on People's Dispatch, we have consistently covered what is called the migrant crisis in the Mediterranean. Over the past many years, thousands of people from conflict-hit zones in Asia and Africa have been trying to escape to safer places in Europe. Now, this involves crossing the Mediterranean Sea. But as many of them are poor, they often travel in ramshackle boats. And they of course don't have visas, so they are considered illegal migrants. Now, European policies towards these migrants are very harsh. Their coast guards often ill-treat them, and there have been a number of cases of migrant boat sinking. This year has been especially deadly. In the central Mediterranean region alone, 441 migrants were reported either dead or missing between January 1st and March 31st. One such incident took place in June when over 80 asylum seekers died after their boat capsized and sank off the Greek coast. Even at that time, the response of the Greek Coast Guard was criticised. Now rights organisations, after a study, have demanded an independent and impartial probe. We go to Anish for more. Anish, thank you so much for joining us. We're taking you out of your usual beat today, but to talk about something which is a disaster, which also has really global implications in every sense of the word. I think there was a lot of shock uh, in June when the accident, when the migrant boat tragedy took place, as they call it, migrant boat tragedy. About 82 people died, uh, you know, and there were a lot of allegations about the insensitivity of the Greek authorities. But as we have talked about many times on People's Dispatch, this is not a one-off incident. This is actually part of a trend. Uh, 2023 has been a really bad year, as, you were just, as, as we were just talking about. So, first of all, maybe could you take us through what these organizations, is, in this case, I believe it's Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. What have they specifically said? regarding this uh, tragedy. Also important, I think, to note because uh, often once this, uh, once an incident of this sort happens, there's condemnation for one or two days. And after that, then things go back to normal in some ways. So it's very useful, I think, to sort of go back and see what happened. That's also important. And what do these organizations say? Yeah, so uh, right now, the, uh, the problem that has been raised and the primary problem that has been raised is the fact that the Greek authorities are actually taking a position that is untenable with the sort of evidence that exists already out in public right now, uh, which includes, apart from testimonies from, uh, you know, various survivors, uh, there are also eyewitness accounts. And this, uh, and there is also the fact that the manner in which the ship was wrecked uh, uh, also clearly indicates that there was a great deal of uh, at the at the best, at its best, carelessness on the part of the Greek Coast Guard. Uh, when they try to uh, tow the this overwhelmingly uh, you know uh, uh, this overwhelmingly populated uh, boat, but at the same and at, at the best, it was a very clear sign of them just trying to sink the boat uh, in a with a procedure that they knew would actually sink it down to the uh, to what fifteen thousand feet uh, of depth in the Mediterranean. Uh, this is uh, definitely what is uh, what is at heart here, because uh, there is definitely a very what we know very well is apart from Greece, there are multiple countries in Europe, especially in the Mediterranean, who have a very clear uh, send the boat back sort of policy, uh, which uh, essentially uh, you know bases its uh, entire methodology methodology on uh, just attacking any kind of migrant boats that come their way or come to their coast. And pretty much that risk, that put actual number of people at greater risk than they already are in. Uh, obviously, if you're talking about a boat, the capsized boat itself, we do not know the number of people, the clear number of people, because estimates vary from about 500 to 750, 000, uh, sorry, 750 people. And that could, uh, and most of them are missing. Uh, we only have uh, about less than 100 survivors. Uh, and about 80 or 82 or so uh, people, about dead bodies were found. A lot of them are missing and presumed dead by now at this point in time. So this is a massive boat tragedy, obviously. Uh, like calling it a boat tragedy at this point has made it, uh, you know, a kind of numb of any kind of sensitivity at this point because this has become such a routine thing and you see the usual suspects the Coast Guards, uh, you know, either taking uh, you know, very uh, kind of dangerous maneuvers around the boards, which may be makeshift. In this case, it was a very a small cruise ship. But in uh, several cases, they actually travel in makeshift boats 
and uh, very often they cannot really handle uh, you know very you know troubled waters and so making dangerous maneuvers can actually also sink these boats towing can sink these boats so they know the kind of uh, methods that can actually put these uh, migrants uh, or, or as we should actually call them asylum seekers at risk uh, of uh, you know at risk in a very dangerous terrain and not not even terrain we are talking about high seas at this point and uh, this is something that is uh, that the greek authorities are trying to uh, you know completely stifle any kind of investigation into those parts uh, they have not taken any kind of wit uh, witness testimonies uh, so far especially from the survivors who have uh, stated that like multiple of them are very clearly have stated that the authorities try to close the boat and they are refusing to take that uh, these testimonies into account in the current investigation and the investigation is only happening primarily because there are greek people uh, protesting against the, they protested at the time when it happened in june and you know multiple media reports at the time actually reported uh very clearly documented the fact that the uh, the authorities were uh, you know were at uh, were to be blamed for the kind of uh, the capsizing of the port actually and uh, the fact that they are dismissing all of this they are saying that they try to uh, you know protect uh, an already sinking boat that's their narrative at this point and uh, which does not really uh, you know fit well with the kind of evidence that we had is the reason why such a demand exists that they need a credible investigation now the question is what can be credible at this point because obviously greek authorities are definitely not going to give you a very credible evidence or a credible investigation maybe european authorities in eu can actually intervene but uh, we do know like a, a significant section within the eu right now are quite conservative dominated and do not support any kind or do not have any sympathies for asylum seekers asylum seekers that we like it might go into a tra different trajectory but asylum seekers are there primarily because of the kind of interventions exactly. military interventions they've conduct, conducted in the uh, across the mediterranean especially in libya and so uh, and you need to also look at the larger picture because it's not just greece as well it's pretty much almost everyone at this point doing pretty much the exact the same thing exactly the same thing of uh, you know targeting boats targeting migrant boats and uh, and not caring whether or not it actually sinks them uh, as long as they are uh, just happy as long as they just uh, do not have as many people coming into their territory right Well, Anish, it's important you mentioned in the larger European context. I think two or three points to note here. One is the fact that, of course, uh, if the migrants or asylum seekers do reach some of these countries, their situation is really, really bad. Often they're treated very badly. In fact, I believe Greece has an extremely poor record of uh, what is called processing uh, some of these asylum seekers, which leads many people to actually dread. you know uh, being ca being captured by the greeks in one ways that's one point i think the other point of course like you said is that there is a european initiative uh, by all the eu members and italy is at the forefront of this also important to mention italy here to actually restrict <coughs> migration in various ways there's already a deal with libya now they're trying to s sign a similar deal with they have <coughs> signed a similar deal with tunisia as well they are offering uh, millions of at least uh, over 100 million dollars uh, dollars at least to actually curb what is migration tunisia also taking a very strong right wing shift so what you're saying is also i think equally uh, you know it's worrying because of the fact that everyone involved the countries from where these migrants are leaving the countries where the migrants want to go all of them are taking such a belligerent attitude towards those who are just escaping war escaping conflict yes exactly at this point uh, this is a situation it's not even like we can't even use the kind of popular terms that we use like cash money situation it's not really that it's pretty much them being stuck in one hellish place and trying to escape into another one and as you rightly pointed out like we is definitely like the whole processing system itself and the fact that we have to wait uh, in squalor in like very slum like conditions in the peninsula's coast uh and uh, risk being attacked there is pretty much no security or safety for them they are actually attacked by racists we have reported uh, on our platform itself about several multiple fires uh on uh, you know refugee or uh, asylum seekers uh, camps and in various instances and that actually uh you know 
makes them extremely unsafe to live there. It's like it becomes very, very close to uninhabitable for many of these uh, migrants as well. And so, as you pointed out, like many of them do try to avoid uh, getting into the hands of the authorities. And sometimes, sometimes or in rare cases, uh, some of these boats also in, have uh, situations where they try to sink themselves just so that they do not get into the hands of coast guards who put them under, you know, even worse conditions. So it's a very, you know, overall terrible situation. And even when they, uh, when these countries, uh, like even the European Union, when they make deals with countries like Tunisia, with Libya, they're not really, uh, you know, giving them money to actually absorb them, absorb these, like Libya did at one point under Gaddafi, uh, where they did absorb these uh, migrants who are escaping war in regions like Sahel and so on, and, uh, you know, giving them jobs, giving them livelihoods. Uh, allowing them to settle down in these territories, and obviously, uh, none of these countries are doing that. They just they're just using even worse, uh, more bel- uh, not belligerent, clearly violent uh, methods to actually prevent these migrants from even coming into their territory, let uh, let alone be processed or uh, you know uh, gain any kind of uh, uh, work or livelihood in the in those regions. So this is a very terrible situation that they have to go through. It's pretty much outsourcing the violence at this point. And at this level that we're looking at, uh, it's actually creating a massive humanitarian situation right now. You have to remember the numbers. Like uh, like ever since the, uh, the invasion of Libya by NATO, we have seen the numbers being in thousands annually. In 2016, about 5,000, more than 5,600 people died uh, or went missing, like missing essentially also equals uh, death because we do not uh, get their bodies, we do not know where they are, and they're presumed dead at, at this point, have died on the Mediterranean. And since then, we have thousands and thousands every year, uh, you know, uh, being reported dead. And these are only re- uh, documented cases. We do not know how many of them, like smaller boards, smaller refugee groups, uh, have tried and failed and probably, uh, you know, went missing in uh, in the Mediterranean as well, because that the level of data that we have is still not that rigorous enough. So this these are just unit RC uh, reports, and that itself shows a very grim picture at this point in time. And that, and pretty much everybody involved is guilty at this point of creating this humanitarian tragedy that pretty much rivals any other tragedy at this point at, uh, right. on Earth right now. Right, thank you so much, Anish, for talking to us. Like you said, I think the issue of refugees, the issue of migrants, of asylum seekers, it's there in Latin America, it's there in many parts of Asia, but definitely the Mediterranean region emerging as one of the uh, hot spots, so to speak. And I think this poses a question, uh, not just to you know individual governments or coast guards, but to the all of humanity in terms of how do we deal with such a vast section of our population, which is uh, which is undergoing substantial suffering, trying to escape that, and then you have this kind of treatment towards them. Thank you so much for shedding some light on this. And that's all we have time for in this weekend episode. We'll be back on Monday with more stories from across the world, more experts giving their analysis of some of the key processes of our time, some of the key developments of our time and how they impact the future. So see you on Monday and please do hit that subscribe button.